Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green. Do we have a, an exciting topic today? What could be more exciting than existing buildings? Well, for those of us who are dedicated to 100% clean electrical energy by the year 2045, we lead the nation in that respect. It's really ambitious. And we have been focusing on new building construction, new homes, new office buildings, but we replace buildings at only about 1% a year. That means that in 100 years, you won't see any existing buildings, but that's a heck of a way to achieve clean energy. We need to focus on existing buildings, and who better to do that than the Honorable Sean Mosley, Project Manager for Trinity ERD. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Howard. Good to be here. Sean has been in the energy efficiency business with uh, buildings and homes for many, many years, possibly more years than you would care to admit. <laughs> but your step into <clears throat> Trinity ERD is a fairly new step up in, in your career. Why don't you tell us first what Trinity ERD does and then what your specialty is uh, here in Honolulu. Okay, um, Trinity ERD, we're a building consulting firm and we focus on basically the full building envelope is our specialty area. Mm -hmm. So that would be all the exterior cladding, the roofs, the waterproofing, above grade, below grade, fenestration. That fenestration being windows. Being windows, yes. <laughs> so you... Everything that's impacted mm -hmm. by the exterior elements, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. means of egress comes into play, fire systems come into play, obviously, mm -hmm. because those interact with the building envelope. But our primary focus is building envelope as a And firm. guess what? If the building is air conditioned and you take proper proceedings on the envelope, you vastly decrease the heat gain into those buildings and the AC size can go down, and instead of running the AC at full blast, you can set it at its sweet spot and just let it purr along at a fraction of the energy use that it might use if it were cycling on and off and perhaps uh, causing uh, moisture conditions and so forth. Is that a good summary of what yeah, you can do? Yeah, it's a good the, summary, uh, but you have a lot of variables. I mean, you have yeah. vapor drive as a big variable, and you have just interior and exterior moisture passage. Mm -hmm. How uh, airtight is your building? Is it too tight mm -hmm. that it holds mm -hmm. too much moisture? Not allowed to breathe? Is it, you know, there's different yep. layers to get and achieve that conservation, yep. Yep. which in the newer building codes in the IBC 2006, which we're currently under 2012 and 2012, for consideration, and then the IECC, which is mandating a lot of the changes as mm -hmm. well. If you're putting a brand new building up, you have a lot more freedoms, if you will, to mm -hmm. use different testing components that are more compliant to those requirements. Mm -hmm. If you're working on existing buildings, which I do a fair amount of, it's a whole different game. An existing building already is an existing structure that can handle so mm -hmm. much weight. Like a roof, for example, you look at uh, R39 insulation or whatever it's required for an attic space. Well, if it's an existing attic and it's hollow, that's really not that much weight. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at a building, that has a rooftop walkable deck it was designed to handle only so much weight load mm -hmm. and now you want to make it energy efficient to the code requirements you know structurally you may be exceeding the ability of that roof and it's a walkable deck to be able to be brought up to energy code and it becomes a life safety concern mm -hmm. so now what do you do because yep. the code official is going to say well here's the iecc and you have to have r20 on the top of a deck mm -hmm. okay but you can't walk on that because it's you know not meant for regular foot traffic, but this was my rooftop deck that I've had for 30 years. You're telling me mm -hmm. I can't use it for what I bought it for? So you come into some careful dances and, you know, with the IABC, the 2018, mm -hmm. which has recently been brought up into discussion because there was a chapter in the 2006 and the 2012 IABC, which chapter 34, basically disappeared in the 2012 writing. Mm -hmm. So now that it's gone, you have no existing building code in yep. the IABC to really make judgment calls with, okay, structural analysis, what's required, mm -hmm. and just saying refer to the IABC won't work because the structural requirements are for new construction, things that can be easily 
adhere yep. to yep. versus something that's 50 or 80 years old. Yeah. So the types of problems that you are building up have been li literally building up, building up until the International Codes Council decided to to totally yeah. update the international existing building code and address the, the type of issues that, that you are uh, bringing up. Here. Yeah, what was fascinating was in the early stages of the 2006 adoption, I was, you know, it was my pleasure to work with the AIA subcommittees on the fenestration and the windborne debris region requirements to look at mm -hmm. what should be a hurricane window, what should not. Yep. Yep. Miles per hour did a lot of work with Gary Chalk and Martin and Chalk and all of those. And with the local builders that say, we can't afford to build this, it's too expensive mm -hmm. because of parts. So that, well, that took a couple of years or so, I think, before, Easy. before stuff kind of came to light that made sense. And there was a whole lot of amendments that had to be written, including, I believe, you worked on a tropical zone to help alleviate some of the challenges that we have in Hawaii that other nations or parts of the nation don't have. Because mm -hmm. unless you're up in Maui or Mauna Kea, you're not getting snow, per se. But a lot of the codes in the IBC are written for seismic load and for snow loads and those things as well. So as a designer, I saw this a lot actually prior to Trinity. I was doing um, work with Breezeway for seven years, working on fenestration and passive air and whatnot. And designers wanted to achieve all the benefits of Hawaii without having to build an igloo because mm -hmm. they didn't mm -hmm. really need an igloo at the beach. So that's where you get into all these different challenges. And it was fun watching some of the new Kakaoka buildings go up and how they worked on the, the building envelope. There's already been challenges with some of those buildings, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're brand new, mm -hmm. you know, and they're already, you know, due for repair and just got their mm -hmm. building turned over for occupancy. So and obviously we, it's not perfect yet. We might add rather expensive occupancy. They are very, very expensive. Yes, yes, yes. You know, definitely not in the affordable housing category. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So. And what, what were in the Kaka'ako buildings? Um, one question that I get asked frequently is the energy code supposedly mm -hmm. restricts the fenestration area, fenestration to wall area to 40% or even 30%. Right. These Kaka'ako buildings look like they are 100% fenestration. <laughs> you know, we know that's not true, but that, that's the way they look. That's, that's the new, you know, building design comes and goes along just a lot like women's fashion does. Yeah. Right. And the current fashion and is Some of those buildings classic. are curvy too, so. Yes, yes, yes. And especially the curvy ones, I think, are having the, the greatest uh, problems. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. That would, that's where just the, the glazing and the insulated glass units, the IGUs, how they're put mm -hmm. together. What is the inner layers? Do they have a low emittance factor, a low E coating? How much solar heat gain does it reflect? Mm -hmm. um, what time of day? Because actually those coatings work based on the elevation of the sun and the exposure. So you can use the same fenestration around the entire building, but only one side is really meant for the extreme energy code requirements. So the other side is almost overkill. And what a lot of people don't consider is what the heat is kept out mm -hmm. is also kept in. So let's say you're a person that has a code compliant, energy compliant unit, but you don't run or want air conditioning. You like mm -hmm. passive cooling, so you're mm -hmm. going to open your awning window all the time. So now you've only got, you know, 30%, 20% or whatever the minimum requirement for air exchange is for mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, you're living in actually a hotter apartment because the glass is doing such a good job at keeping the heat in also. Mm -hmm. So it's a catch-22. You know, if you're going to air condition all the time and you're going to have good air exchange, then it's not so much of a problem. But a lot of places I've been in, they don't run around AC all the time. And then there are those that they do want because a hotel or maybe it's an Airbnb that's not legal, but that's why mm -hmm. they bought the expensive unit. You know, that's just happening. And I can see with like a lot of the energy code requirements where, you know, you put the key card in. Once you take a key card mm -hmm. out, everything turns off and shuts yeah. down. That, so, that's part of the code, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And that's all wonderful. Code, you know, yeah. the improved LED lighting mm -hmm. and all of that. And, the you know, for the, the, the egress means for, you know, fire safety for the fire chiefs and the firemen mm -hmm. and all, that's all really good and effective. But it also is effective on new construction where it's much easier to design to it. Because you have the right somewhat of building orientation, you know, mm -hmm. west facing versus south and north. So how much overhang is required, mm -hmm. how much is not required. You know, mm -hmm. I, I like to look at UH West Oahu 
mm. which um, it's a very well done building because they have all the fenestration on this high where it doesn't have the worst solar heat gain. Yeah, so they have this, this incredible north, view. North facing side then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they took advantage of building orientation and, mm -hmm. and whatnot mm -hmm. and were able to be cold compliant and also not have to be excessive about how they did it. Mm -hmm. But the structure is new. It was, you know, all the geotechnical survey was done so they could build a nice big facade to hold such a building and also be close to a windborne region for um, hurricane. So mm -hmm. They pulled mm -hmm. that one off. But again, that's new construction. It's not the 50, 60, 70 other buildings in Waikiki. Yep, 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 which, which we need to deal with by George, yeah. Yeah, because yep. a lot of the people that are in the older buildings, you know, I think the typical occupancy I come across, when we're asked as a, as a firm we go in, besides doing building envelope and repair and design, we do, do it for both new construction and existing. Um, we also do assessments of properties. You know, people say, hey, our building is 30 years old. We don't need, we need to know where the maintenance is negligent, mm -hmm. what might have to change soon. Part of you. So we go through and do the assessment of the whole thing. Sometimes we do a capital reserve study and say, here you go, for the next 30 years, here's kind of the expenses that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting parts is when you do that, you have to look at compliance to code. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And how's this going to come up? I mean, some people say, well, if it's not there as it was built, then, well, you got no problem. Well, no, not true. Because once you want to change your roof, for mm -hmm. example, and you're going to tear it off, you now have to be compliant under the IBC. Yeah, or, and the IECC, the energy mm -hmm. code is, as well. Yeah. And there's yeah. nowhere that it's relaxed. Mm -hmm. And the way, the, the way the permitting works right now, the local DPP, I mean, they want to see your drawings and your intensive design for initial review. Mm -hmm. Or you send it to third party review. And mm -hmm. either way, you've invested a lot of time and energy yep. for and, approval. And money, yeah when you don't even know if you're going to get it. So, mm -hmm. and when you went into the 2006 and the 2012 IBC, it has that chapter 34, which talks about existing buildings, but all those areas they're afraid to discuss get referred back to the IBC, and then they require the local city and counties to amend appropriately. Mm -hmm. And we have, what, I don't know, 35 pages of amendments that are here and there scattered, pages, something like yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. So, one of the challenges I face within the work that I do with our firm is, okay, these people need a new roof. All right, how are we going to give them a new roof? Yeah, it seems easy enough to get a bid, put a new roof on. Mm -hmm. But is that new roof going to be safe? That's a good question. You know, yeah. is the people that are four stories below, are they going to realize all the benefits of insulating a concrete roof on the first floor? Likely not. Mm -hmm. It's only the fourth floor occupant. Yep. Yep. So now you're saying, okay, I got to put this new roof on. And only the fourth floor occupant is likely going to benefit because the bottom three floors are all passively cooled. Great. Mm -hmm. So they'll have this really wonderful roof, but they might not be able to go on it safely with more than two of their friends or four of their friends. Mm -hmm. because so there's you too can't much make it low. into a major roof garden No, because it wasn't that. the intent or the design yeah. of the building yeah. at yeah. that time. Yeah. You know, so that's some of the barricades that are coming up because if... If you want to make the roof compliant for the dead load and the live load, which turns into your ultimate strength, you have to reinforce it structurally. Mm -hmm. And I, the minute you say that, I'm, dollar signs are going off in my head. Yeah. 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 And then where do you yeah. reinforce yeah. it? Right in the middle of their bedroom? Yeah. Yeah. Put a nice post <laughs> in the middle of the bedroom. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I heard yeah. of some of the Kakako buildings, you got columns in the middle of your rooms. I guess that's one way to do it. But mm. that's not really feasible. So what happens is people defer the work or they don't get mm -hmm. permits on the work. Yep. And they hire in Joe Pickup to come in and just do patches and repairs mm -hmm. and then... And what happens two, three, four, five years down the road? Well, on that cheery note, we need to take a very brief break. Code Green, Howard Wig, Shod Mosley, back in a moment. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you 
every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on ThinkTech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Mahalo. Good afternoon again, Howard Wig, Code Green here with Sean Mosley talking about existing buildings and the more Sean talks, the more complex and potentially expensive bringing green or building, bringing existing buildings up to code sounds. This is no easy chore. So Sean, welcome back. And why Thank don't you. we go to the, the first slide here? and uh, yeah. see what's going so, on there. So recently, yeah. Craig Stevenson from the IECC came to Honolulu to do a presentation for the State Building Code Council, reviewing the different options. And the IEBC was not heavily considered up until recently when the Chapter uh, 34 has been taken away from it. Now, now let's define IEBC again. So International Existing Building Code. Yeah. So just a few different slides that were random that, were, that I picked out of his presentation with their approval, uh, just so you know. So mm -hmm. exceptions, allow alterations to be done under the code adopted at the time of original construction of the building or portion of the building subject to the approval of the code official. This is really critical because if you're trying to get energy compliant or you're trying to improve a roof structure or repair a wall that's falling apart, you know, mm -hmm. if you're using the IBC, the, the structure requirements, the International Building Code, the yeah. International Building Code may exceed the ability of what you can do to that building, mm -hmm. which is why the code at the time of adoption will now be referenced. Mm -hmm. And they say, okay, well, we got to consider it was meant for this structural design pressure and mm -hmm. this much wind loading, and this is all we have to work with, but how can we reinforce it better? So that's a really fascinating aspect of the IEBC, which mm -hmm. is not referenced in the IBC. And it puts a lot of pressure, doesn't it? Judgmental pressure on, it on the building. It puts a ton on pressure. the building department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which is, uh, if you pull up the next slide, yeah. uh, if you don't mind, sir, it talks about uh, powers of the code official. Now, mm -hmm. we've always known with the IBC, they have the final say to determine stuff, but this basically mandates that they make sure that the permit meets certain requirements. So it's actually going to put more time on their review of your application. But what's a nice aspect of it, because of what's happening with their requirements, is you can ask for a meeting before you get into major design mm -hmm. and say, hey, we've got this old building. It's not historical yet. It needs a new roof. And we mm -hmm. talk about how we can accomplish this, get closest to our energy requirements, mm -hmm. but still have it be safe and still have means of egress and life compliance and all that in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. place for that. So that was a, a real big one that I know will be heavily discussed amongst subcommittees looking after the adoption of the mm -hmm. IABC. And might the a really good example of that being that the windows were, it's a 1995 building, mm -hmm. windows were in code compliance back then, yeah. but we know there's a little thing called climate change, yep. and we know that the hurricanes, looks like they may not hit us this season, right. but they're going <laughs> to hit us. And Hur so, hurricanes are inevitable. It's just time. Yeah. And so how about this, this safety aspect? Um, you need to put a, a film on the, the windows to make them yeah, hurricane so resistant. There's, there's a lot of ways would, around it. Um, mm -hmm. In the IABC, everybody would be told, just put in hurricane glass. So on the first mm -hmm. seven stories, it's large missile impact glass. So it's very thick and it's extremely heavy. I forget mm -hmm. the exact pounds per square foot, but it's very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. It takes a few people. And you go seven stories and above, you can go to small missile and it's lighter. So that way, if you have windborne debris, the small missile is usually meant for like aggregate roofs where it's all flying off the top and swirling mm -hmm. around the building and causes damage to the glass. 
But if the building, and I'm actually looking into the property with this very scenario, if the building is 40 years old, and it's only got a four or five inch concrete slab holding it up, mm -hmm. and now you're going to throw, for lack of a better term, an 800 pound window system on the, when the one that was there before mm -hmm. was 150, you're going to do that up 40 stories. Yeah, we're, we're talking about a few some issues. Here. Yeah. And yeah. how do you reinforce that? Now you're relying mm -hmm. on the structure of the window to be the structural element through the whole building. You, mm -hmm. you can't do that. It has to be somewhat independent mm -hmm. and be, you know, like containing itself within that opening. So the catch-22 or the workaround was, okay, well, there are internal films that you can get through local yeah, manufacturers ask about that. where yeah. it gives you the impact requirements. Mm -hmm. And there is glazing that's a uh, double glaze that's not as heavy where you can get the energy requirements met. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can still work within it without having to go heavy commercial, yeah, yeah, yeah. new construction style of building. And, and probably doubtlessly save a ton of money that way too. I mean, yeah. window film is not all that expensive and there are very, very skilled guys who can put that film on fairly quickly. Yeah, well yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. you, you look at a regular sliding door, it might cost you 1200 bucks for a panel that doesn't move and one that does, it's you know, six foot eight high. Mm -hmm. You take that same one and you put hurricane impact glass in it, it's about $5,000. <laughs> so now you have, you know, grandma and grandpa who've lived in their property for 35 years mm -hmm. and their doors are broken and they need a new door, but they lived on a fixed retirement. Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell them, okay, it's going to cost you 10 grand after installation to put mm -hmm. just that door in. Mm -hmm. It gets kind of challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and no, nobody wants to put that type of burden on grandma and grandpa. And no. we have so many examples of that in, in Hawaii. Right. You know, people got their home 40, 50 years ago when it was affordable. They've lived there. They've raised their kids. They now have their grandkids. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful home. They've got fixed income. Yeah. yeah. Now, unfortunately, yeah. there's always that maintenance factor where you go into buildings mm -hmm. and they just didn't take care of the stuff. So mm -hmm. it needs to be fixed. But there are ways to make it safer and more compliant yeah. without trying to pretend to be the international building code standard only. Yeah. And that's yeah. where the and that, that's IABC where the comes very important. Comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a couple more slides. Why don't we bring up the next one here? Sure. So permit requirements, um, basically submittal requirements. That hasn't changed too much. You have to detail your fire protection, your means of egress exterior wall envelope, the balconies, walking services, and the site plan. So that's a pretty standard thing there. But what has changed is the framing members of the roof and the systems that you have to consider and mm -hmm. explain out. So now if you're working on an existing building that no longer has structural drawings mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. 35 or 40 years old. Mm -hmm. my, my house is 50 something years right. old. So and do you have the original drawings or do you have to tear parts of the wall out to figure out how it was really built inside? Yeah. You see, so that's mm -hmm. where the code mm -hmm. officials determination, what you know is the built condition. So that's where more destructive investigation comes into play, yeah. where you take a component of the building that is not going to affect the overall area. It's so, okay, this is how it's made. And then you can do the calculations. Because unfortunately, you know, a lot of the DPP drawings got put in the microfiche. D D DPP meaning Department, Department of Planning of and yeah. Permitting. Yeah. So you can pull newer drawings up online, mm -hmm. but otherwise you had to go sit down there in microfiche and look through <laughs> and hope that the architect or the contractor at the time finished the as-built drawings with any modifications and changes to say this is what your building's made like. Mm -hmm. And then maybe so far in the last year I've gone down there, I've gotten 30% lucky with finding something that gave me the information required. 30%? Yeah. Mm. So that's where a lot of it comes down into a little bit of deconstructive investigation and analysis of the component trees so that we can say, okay, here is a safe design, most code compliant. Now we can have a discussion with the local yeah. building officials, the structural engineers, the architects, and mm -hmm. Sarah, we're putting together something that is safe. And yeah, the, the key word there being safe. I mean, I, I'm an energy code guy, but certainly first and foremost, yeah. I want another build, a, a retrofitted building to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, you can yeah. see everything. I mean, I, mm -hmm. one project I was aware of, it took a year and a half of building permit to come through for lights, for lights on the ground because of the changes in the codes. So... Mm -hmm. You can't put these new lights that are more energy efficient in because they're missing certain listing requirements. Okay, mm -hmm. so for a year and a half, we got to use no lights. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So that's not a life safety issue. Yep. So that's where those little ironic things come in and people just scratch their head. They're like, 
is the, the, the DPP, Department of Building and Planning, saying, oh, no, the book says this. Mm -hmm. they got to follow the book. And the, so the architect and the yeah. engineers, everyone involved has to say, okay, well, it's got to be this. And then there's a back and forth. So. And, and then what you're showing here, I think the, the word that comes up for me is flexibility. Yeah. You and you, the designer and the building code official, are allowed some flexibility here. Yeah, to, yeah, it's working within reason of what you've mm -hmm. already got to yeah. work with and yeah. saying, well, this is how we can improve it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the lady that was here talking to us before the show, she's mm -hmm. talking about the outrigger. Yeah. And, and how the, the walls spalling. are falling apart and the spalling's breaking them up. Mm -hmm. You can fix that. You can reinforce that. Yeah. There are ways to do it. You just got to know what you're doing in the right way. Mm -hmm. Don't just say, oh, let's just slap a patch on there. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That would be quite a little more work. Way. Yeah. I, I think we have one more slide coming yep. up here. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a big one change of mm -hmm. occupancy. This yeah. is nothing new, really. The IBC addresses it. But in the IEBC, it gives a little bit more leniency or understanding what the original building was intended for, and if you're changing the occupancy, what you have to add to do it. But in these different variations, you have different levels of alterations that you work with, a level one, a level two, and a level three, which is not in the slide. A level one has you know, prescriptive methods, so you're saying, I'm gonna do all these different things, and it meets all the different codes by this reason. A level mm -hmm. two, you're saying, I'm, I'm fixing less than 50% of my building and I'm not doing anything structural to it. It's just mm -hmm. changing yeah. some of the windows out, doing some new signage for, you know, it's going from a business to a, you know, housing yeah, or something. Yeah, nothing. And we've got about 30 seconds left. Yep. And number, you weren't going to go into level number three? Number three is anything yeah. over 50% is basically you're really stuck yeah. to the IBC requirements. You're treating it as if it were a new building. You are. At least that aspect of the building. So right. say you're going to redo the whole lighting system, it must comply with the up-to-date yeah. uh, lighting requirements. But then you'll know if you're triggering that much requirement what you're working with mm -hmm. before you get into it and you can have that discussion with the authority having jurisdiction saying, yeah, if you can meet all this, then go for it. Mm -hmm. If you can't, yeah, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. So we're moving along here, uh, you know, addressing the existing building problem, and it is certainly a problem, but you certainly enlightened me as to the different options that you have yeah. to bring, bring existing into not just energy code compliance, but uh, the, the health and safety uh, issues also. Yeah. It'll help preserve a lot of the buildings that people don't yeah, want to lose. Yeah, yeah. At, at, a, at a reasonable price. Yeah. Yeah. So on that very, very cheery note, it is time to bid fond to do once more. Thank you, thank you, Sean yeah, Mosley, for a being a very, very educated and informed uh, guest. And see you next time on Code Green Hawaii.